Thank you. Uh, now we have this awkward moment where I try to see if the technology is actually working. Great. So uh, as you've heard five times now, my name is Ken Shockley. And uh, I am, uh, joking aside, spectacularly privileged uh, to be here. I can't imagine being attached to an institution, Colorado State University, that's more in line with the kind of interests that I have um, to do the work that I hope I can do over the rest of my career. And to, in a department of philosophy that's made us so welcome over the course of the last just three months we've been here. This uh, August 5th, we moved into, the, into Fort Collins, and we can't imagine not being here now. Uh, and it's just a moving testament to me and my family that we've been able to feel so at home so quickly. Uh, and particularly to Holmes Ralston III and Ken and Myra Montfort Foundation, which made this chair possible and allowed me to make my quick move to the Mountain West. Um, I can't thank them enough for putting this in place and demonstrating their commitment both to me and to the field of environmental ethics. But, uh, but it's not easy to thank Holmes Ralston properly um, because it's not just that he sort of made this position work. He sort of, he made the field work that makes this position make sense. It wouldn't make sense to have a position in environmental ethics without the work that Holmes done over the last decades. And so I was trying to struggle, like, how do you thank somebody properly for that kind of, uh, not just making something happen, but making the background conditions available such that the position would make sense at all? And that's kind of a, it's going to be a pun by the time I finish my talk today. That's sort of the same kind of idea that I'm talking about. But I was thinking back to graduate school. And in graduate school, I was studying the work of Willard von Ornen Klein, uh, the uh, logician and philosopher from Harvard, uh, sort of a distinguished career, had lots of famous students. But maybe one of, the mo one of the most famous was a guy named Donald Davidson, who did a particular kind of philosophy of language that was indebted not just by, uh, not just by training and by the fact that he got his training from such an eminent scholar, but the very kind of work he did was conditioned by uh, the advances that Quine made. In the beginning of... Uh, Donald Davidson's Inquiries into Truth and Meaning, a collection of his essays. He has a dedication that's very simple and very much to the point. It just says simply, to W.V.O. Quine, without whom not. And I think that's basically the same kind of line that should be expressed here. To Holmes Ralston III from the entire environmental ethics community, without whom not. It wouldn't exist at all. So uh, we needed Holmes to make this position happen. This is my brutal segue. Uh, we needed Holmes to make this position happen. But they need a lot of other things for humans to flourish. And that's going to be my topic today. While the traditional f uh, focus of some of sort of the, uh, some approaches to environmental ethics, uh, ethics is to start focusing, uh, focusing almost exclusively on the nature of the environment, on the environment apart from humans, there's been a transition over the last few decades to shift on the interdependence of humans in their natural environment. And what I'd like to do today is to think about that relationship from a slightly different direction by taking a new look at a very old idea, to try to connect humans and their environment by means of appealing to Aristotelian notions of, the ex of external goods. So the question that I had in the flyer, the question to motivate this talk, comes down to this idea. How do we balance environmental protection with the need for human development? And by human development, I'm talking about the kind of sustainable development we need to provide resources to the most vulnerable in the world, and also to ourselves for we're vulnerable as well, just in different ways, in different kinds of ways. And this trade-off is necessary if we think it's ever the case that there isn't a strict priority between environmental protection and human development. And there are very few people who think there should be a strict priority. In fact, Holmes has, uh, wrote uh, a paper that's often used in introductory, introductory environmental ethics courses that's, that says explicitly, sometimes under very constrained circumstances, very extremely constrained circumstances, it might be the case that we ought to save, the, save features of the environment instead of feeding people. It's a bold claim. But if we take this seriously, that this is a balancing act, there are some times we have to realize there are trade-offs to be made, difficult choices to be made, brutal choices to be made. And making those trade-offs involves having some way of making the measurement, of making the balance work between environmental protection and the development of human communities. Now, I'm going to approach this uh, in a slightly different way. I'm going to approach it by looking at a challenge laid out by the eminent economist and philosopher, Amartya Sen. For he lays out a challenge asking us to find a framework to engage in this kind of balancing act. He does it indirectly, and I'll get to that in a second. 
But in looking at the way he frames that challenge, we'll see what I'm going to call an environmental blind spot in the way in which he approaches the problem of making, of making this balance. And by looking at the way in which that blind spot is characterized, it'll provide us the seeds of forming a response, the beginnings of a response both to his challenge and the beginnings of an answer to the question that I'm using to frame this talk. And the formal response I'm using is to think, as I pointed out in the flyer for this talk, that we should think about our natural environment in the same kind of way we think about our social environment. And that will lead us to talk about the way in which Aristotle thought of external goods, which he, ta called, which he talked about in terms of being constitutive, that is part of, a composite part of human flourishing. And that relationship will provide a means of generating a response to the challenge and thereby the beginnings of an answer to the, uh, an answer to the question that phrased it. But Aristotle's notion of external goods needs to be extended, I'll suggest. And we think of these external goods not simply as the kind of friendship and social goods that he talked about, but also in terms of a broad swath of environmental goods that have the same kind of structural role in flourishing that we could have expected out of Aristotelian external goods. But once we include uh, environmental goods, it's not just these features of the world that matter so much, it's the ways in which they're generated. And that will bring us back to the work, very briefly, of Holmes. For Holmes Ralston, the third one of the things he's most famous for is the generation of what he calls systemic value. And what I'll be talking about later is the way in which systems, ecological systems, and nature writ large has a particular kind of value in terms of the generative capacities it has for creating these environmental goods. And while that's a long arc, by the time we get there, we should see that there's the beginnings of a normative framework, the beginnings of a way of answering that initial challenge, and by means of answering that challenge, answering the forma formative question at the beginning of the talk. All right, so there's the long-winded introduction and the narrative. Here's where we're gonna go. So in about two years ago, in August 22nd, 2014 edition of the New Republic, Amartya Sen, Nobel Prize winning economist Amartya Sen, um, writes this piece. It's sort of a bold charge. He says, environmentalists, please stop obsessing about global warming. Environmentalists, he says, are ignoring poor countries' needs. The worry here was primarily about energy access. His worry is that by shifting to clean energy, by shifting our energy, our energy composition in a certain way, we are going to end up impoverishing people when they needed energy the most. The most vulnerable communities would be affected most by the transition from dirty energy to clean energy, and that looks like a particularly unfair thing. But underneath this characterization of the problem, underneath this charge, is really a background challenge as he says, despite the ubiquity and the reach of environmental dangers, a general normative framework for the evaluation of these dangers has yet to emerge. And here's the challenge. Find me such a normative framework, right? If you can't do it, you failed in your job. So let's not fail. So here's the challenge. He says, there's a need for greater clarity in deciding on how to think ethically about the environmental challenges in our contemporary world. This I'll take to be a platitude. Clarity is a thing that every philosopher thinks is important. Fixing challenges is something that everyone who worries about the environment is important. So far, so good. But here's where it gets interesting. And this is the text immediately following. He says, focusing on human freedom, including our freedom to think about what responsibilities we have, along with our interest in our own quality of life, can help in this understanding and shed light not only on the demands of sustainable development, but also on the content and relevance of what we can identify as, in quotes, environmental issues. Now notice the angle he takes on this. We frame our environmental problems in terms of human freedom. Now, Sen's account of freedom and human flourishing, uh, at one point I had like a, a bunch of slides on this in here, I just threw them all out, because it's like an hour and a half talk to try to figure out what, how to make sense of what he calls the capabilities approach. But here's the basic, really fast idea. We shouldn't think about human flourishing in terms of the state people are in, like how much happiness you have or material wealth you have, what kind of level of well-being. What we really need is to figure out how people can bring about their own conception of flourishing, something that makes sense to them. And more importantly, how we can take the material, social, cultural, and political goods around us and convert them into a way of life that's meaningful to us. Now, that all sounds very abstract, but here's the basic idea. You can give people lots of food, and you can give them, say, the right to vote. But unless they're able to have the right kind of nourishment 
to live the kind of life where they can reflect and think about voting and at the same time, uh, in the same time utilize that vote not simply as something they have to do on the side but as part of who they are as a political citizen then neither food nor voting matter. Unless you can actualize as part of an ongoing development of your life these particular resources, it isn't flourishing, it's just being. And humans aren't beings in that sense, right? We're active creatures and that, that's a very important feature to them. Now this sounds like kind of a progressive, a progressive way of thinking about human flourishing um, and by most metrics it is. But notice what's happened in the background is that the environment has slipped to the side. So at the beginning of this, we start out thinking about the environment as the, as the focal point, and by the end, it's in quotes, scare quotes. What are these environmental issues? But problems for human, uh, human freedoms. Now, where does the environment fall? If we step back just about 10 years, in 2004, Sen writes this piece in the London Review of Books, Why We Should Preserve the Spotted Owl. Now, it's supposed to be a lecture, but I'll just ask a question. Do you think it's for the sake of the spotted owl? No, it's an almost rhetorical question, I guess. No, it's not. It's not for the sake of the spotted owl, right? Um, what it is for the sake of, and this is going to sound strange, hopefully my uh, two-minute introduction to Sen will help this, though. Rather, it's because doing so advances the substantive freedoms of people today. How can spotted owls advance substantive freedoms? Well, here's one way, and this isn't the way that Sen's going to encourage. This is the thing he's moving away from. A spotted owl might provide a certain material resource for people. You might take people over, uh, you might guide people and get money to do so and say, lo, a spotted owl and get paid for it and there you are, right? Or in fact, it might go the other way around, which is why this piece came up. You might kill all the spotted owls so that you don't have to stop logging a chunk of the Pacific Northwest, right? On the other hand, uh, what Sen is arguing for in the substantive freedoms is that what he cares about is whether or not people have opportunities to choose different forms of life. And if there are environmental features, an owl, we'll call an owl a feature, uh, available, that's an opportunity that wouldn't be there were the owls not to be there, right? So the idea is that features of the environment fit into different forms of life between which you might choose. And that makes the opportunities made available by these environmental features central to human flourishing. In short, a less diverse, impoverished world has fewer choices and we flourish less because of it. Right? More opportunities, more diversity, more environmental diversity, more, more opportunities, more freedoms, more choices, better human lives. As he puts it in the 2014 piece, the sustaining of ecosystems and the preservation of species can be given new grounds by the recognition of human beings as reflective agents rather than as passive patients. We ground the value of ecosystems and species and the entire the environment in terms of its relation to humans' reflective capacities. Now this is, this is supposed to be a step forward, and indeed it is, right? For it's not simply the environment as a material resource, the object that we turn to, uh, the resource that we use to generate this conception of life from, but rather the environment serves as a set of choices that when we reflect on what kind of life might I want, right, that the environment figures into that in a bunch of different ways. And as we can choose between them, this enriches our lives and the prospects for human existence. This is the Sen model. But, uh, so the thought is you can value the environment either in terms of material resources, making possible human freedoms. So I plant the seeds before me and up comes grain and therefore I have a certain material resource. That's a good thing. Or I can also see the planting of grain as a way of becoming a farmer, a way of life, an option I might choose. These are two different ways the environment might fit into our lives uh, and this is sort of the Sen model. But in, in these cases, we see the environment either as a resource to be utilized or an object to be formed into a conception of the good life. But this, is an there, this involves an environmental blind spot. This says either the environment is a resource on the one hand or it's an object to be promoted, but it doesn't involve the environment as being tied up with our, in, our, in our sense of what it is to be human in any meaningful way. We seem to be lost between the resources and the things we might desire. And that lost place is what I'm calling the environmental blind spot. All right. <clears throat> so how do we fill this blind spot? What's our response? I think we can start by recognizing this clue. We don't think about 
a lot of the world in terms of simply resources and objects. There is a lot of middle ground to be had if we just look differently in different places. And one place we can look is in terms of the social environment. For we think of the social environment not simply as resources to be utilized for our own personal flourishing or an object we might aspire toward. If that was so, you'd be the worst friend in the world. Right? Because friendship is tied up with flourishing, not as a means to some notion of flourishing or as something you aspire toward, but as part of what it is to, in fact, flourish. The social environment is replete with examples of this. And we can look, we can look back a little historically and find those examples. Now, to try to fill in why I think we should think about the natural environment in the same way as the social environment, I'll rely on two somewhat technical ideas. The first is this idea of constitutive, of constitutive dependence. Right? And this is the idea that there are some things that have the relationship of part of something else. And I don't think it's too technical, but it does play a crucial role, so it's worth flagging coming up. And tied up with this idea of constitutive dependence is the thought that in thinking about the environment, it's best to get past what I'll, come, what I'll call the projection of need. That if we think about the role the environment has, either in terms of a resource or in terms of an object, we're thinking about the needs we might have and not the role it might have in providing us with something. And that difference, which I'll, call, which I'll refer to and um, I'll talk about later in terms of the direction of fit, um, is crucially important to understanding why this constitutive matter is so central to human flourishing. OK. <clears throat> so there we are. The challenge laid out. Find me a framework. The problem, there's a blind spot in the middle, somewhere between the resource and the object. Right? Um, the response is, we have other places where we can fill that blind spot socially. Why not think about environment the same way we think of the natural environment the same way we think about our social environment? And I'm suggesting we approach that by thinking about the Aristotelian notion of external good. All right. So external goods. Here's an old notion with an old painting. Uh, the old notion is this tied up that uh, is tied up with the idea that for human flourishing, according to Aristotle, um, humans had to have certain goods that is constituent features of what it was to flourish. Now these goods, uh, these goods weren't just means to the end of flourishing; they were part of flourishing. I'm just going to keep harping on this constitutive relationship thing over and over again. It's so central, right? So. Uh, for Aristotle, in the very least, these goods had to be tied up with the particular features that were central to what it was to be human. Now, if you ask Aristotle, right, humans have a certain, uh, certain kind of essence. And that essence is tied up with, we can characterize at least, in terms of qualities of being human. Humans, it's said, are rational animals, as we've heard, right? And, and they're political animals. So all of, these, um, all of these basic external goods will be tied up somehow with the way in which human character is tied up. For our purposes, the essence isn't important. What matters most is that this is a conception. Uh, the essence isn't important. What matters is this is a constitutive part of flourishing. There's a third one, a third feature of human existence for Aristotle, which I think is underdeveloped, but it's also the one that plays the most central role in, in Sen. And that's that humans are active beings. As I uh, cheekily refer to them as my students, um, that we think of them as rational. We think of humans as rational because we have big heads. We talk too much, which means we're political creatures. And we have thumbs, which means we're active and engaged creatures. This is sort of a central feature of what human existence is. We have these basic qualities. And we should expect any account of flourishing to contain these basic qualities. Now, what goods do we need to be political beings, to be active beings, and to be rational beings? Well, we need a lot of stuff that's not of our own choosing, that's not under our unilateral control. So Aristotle is no stoic. He thinks that you can't live simply, by, simply in isolation, and you can't live simply by retreating into yourself. So central to what flourishing is requires that we have these external goods, which are, as John Cooper writes, goods, thing, good things one can possess that lie outside one's own mind, character, physical makeup, and constitution. Now, that's the way he defines it, but even for someone as renowned as John Cooper, it's a little bit sloppy because that means this might be an external good, and it's, the clicker is not an external good. It's at best a tool. What, uh, it's good, but it's not the right kind of good. What we need is something that's tied up with my conception of the good life, something, importantly, that's relational, something that ties me to features of the world around me and thereby enables me to have a flourishing life in the context that I'm living in. All right. Now, the particular things that Aristotle talks about are friends. And the slide's going to be way too low. Um, friends. So this is a relational good for the obvious sense that it's not friendship 
as a state, but actual particular friends that you might have. You're related to them in virtue of, as Aristotle says, uh, being another self, someone that you would eat salt with, this basic notion of another person that you can relate to in a very intimate setting. Um, he thinks this is essential to have flourishing, to have friends. <clears throat> Honor. Uh, we're, we're thought to have honor in the sense that we need esteem from our peers. This doesn't mean you have to rise up above them, but rather you have the respect, uh, respect of being part of a community. Power. Now, power sounds like a classic Greek notion of crushing thine enemies, but really what's going on here is this is a relationship between an individual and the institution, political, and social structures in which they're situated. Your ability to make change, not simply to have a voice, but to enact that voice in the world around you. And then lastly, and this is the tough one, money. Aristotle says that money is a constitutive feature of, the, of, of human flourishing. Now, this might sound weird because I, I just said that a good is characterized as something that's part of flourishing. And money is also, for those of you who've been doing Aristotle, uh, money is also characterized as an instrumental good. And that seems like these are two different things. So here's what I take to be the problem. This is my 30 seconds of Aristotle exegesis, right? Um, that you think of good in two different ways. We think of goods as the resources, and we think of goods as the transition of those resources into something that's intrinsically good. And if we keep those collapsed, we'll end up with this confusion. Money is, money is simply an instrument. It's a means of, of getting stuff. But what it really is, and how it is as an external good, it is the process by which you convert resources into a conception of the good life that makes sense, right? If you're Robin Crusoe living in an island, money doesn't do you a darn bit of good. Its social function is to allow you to take material resources you couldn't otherwise get and turn them into some notion of flourishing, some conception of the good life, all right? This exegesis matters because this means that what money really is, is it's an external good which categorizes the relation between a person and the material world around them. Right? So, how do you flourish? You have to be able to use the resources around you. Not simply as material means you're moving around, but to turn that into something that matters as part of your flourishing. That make sense? All right, good. Then I got you. Because once you have these relational goods in place, I think we're going to roll through the rest of this pretty easily. All right. <clears throat> the crucial point that I'll belabor, external goods are part of flourishing, not simply means or uh, not, simply, uh, not simply instrumental means to flourishing. Now, I promised you I'd belabor constitutive relationships. Here's the point. So I love this painting. Uh, I saw it as a kid, and I've been stuck with it, even though it's been referred to as naive. It's a, it's a Rousseau, and uh, asked me in Q&A why I chose Rousseau as a, as a joke about the other Rousseau that's famous, uh, that's famous in philosophy. But uh, the face is striking, right? Now, I can think about this painting <coughs> um, in a couple of different ways, and I'm just checking to make sure. Um, I can think about the painting in a couple of ways. The painting was made possible, is made possible, by the brushstrokes of Henri Rousseau, right? If not for those brushstrokes, then the painting wouldn't exist. But in another sense, the painting is made possible by the relationship of that weird face of that tiger to the broader image of the storm around it. It's super easy to, con uh, to conflate making possible into one of those two interpretations and to let them collapse together. But one is an instrumental relationship. The painting is made possible by the instrumental actions of the person using the instrument of the painting, paintbrush, and the painting is made possible by the composition of the, uh, the composition of the various parts of it. And what constitutive value is focused on is the way in which the compositions join together to form something that has a distinct value because of its composition. Now, in, in value theory, uh, we end up saying something like this. I personally think that the painting is more ex uh, explanatory than the definition, but the idea is a thing is constitutively valuable insofar as it makes possible something of intrinsic value and does so, that is what makes possible mean, by partly characterizing that which has intrinsic value. Right? So the part is we have to, the, the point is we have to provide a general characterization of the thing with intrinsic value by appealing to its constituent parts. Make sense? And that's why external, external goods are supposed to be so important for this project. For human flourishing has, requires constitutively goods that are made possible by our social environment. Money doesn't work without a society. Friendship doesn't work without a society, even if it's a dyadic, very small society, right? Honor, power, all of these are made possible by certain social arrangements that enable these goods, that bring them into existence, and thereby make flourishing work. All right. 
So if, I've, if I'm successful now, I've convinced you that the particular way in which we should approach the challenge presented by Sen is by looking at the ways in which other things play a constitutive role in flourishing. If I'm successful, you, you believe that about social goods. You think that, say, friendship and relationships are part of what it is to actually flourish. And I think we can expand that, extend that notion to the idea of environmental goods. <clears throat> so filling the environmental blind spot. And uh, I have to race in this, but I'll at least, at least make the wise crack, right? The missing shade of green was the original shade of this, the original part of this. But um, yeah. So what I have to do is convince you that there are environmental, uh, environmental external goods that constitute, the, they have the right kind of constitutive relationship. So just as in the social environment we have these, these constitutive goods, so as in the natural environment. And in doing so, I have to show a special kind of dependence that the environmental goods have for you. And this requires us to get past the idea that these are tied up with our projection of what we want, but rather tied up with who we are or something else that's central that allows and enables us to have these uh, projections of needs. And that will require talking for a second about direction of fit. Now, direction of fit is a philosophical concept that's most at home in metaethics and philosophy of mind. Uh, but it's really very broad-based. I think it's, it's almost underutilized, so I'll just exploit it. Um, and uh, we see it, the basic contrast is just this, in this context. There's a difference between what we want or need for flourishing and what environmental systems actually produce. Right? Now, this, I hope this is intuitive because the entire field of economics relies on this to exist. Right? The whole basis of a contrast between want and existence is what makes there to be scarcity and economics goes off, right? So this is what it's based on, this contrast. And also it's straightforwardly intuitive uh, that we have to recognize that what we may want may not be what there in fact is, right? Um, Sen's focus is on the needs of the developing world, to jump back. The needs of the developing world, and why shouldn't it be? Amartya Sen uh, received a Nobel Prize in no small part for rethinking the nature of, of classical economics so we could focus more particularly on the way in which the needs of the most vulnerable weren't being met because we failed to recognize the right kind of models. So we need to think substantially like about the particular kinds of things that they needed and in his case the kinds of freedoms they needed to have to, in order to allow for full flourishing. Power had to be built into our account of economics. But in doing that, his lens was exclusively on needs and how those needs were or weren't being met. And this leads to his environmental blind spot. So what we need is to get, what we need is to get beyond the projection of need that, Sen, uh, that, that shaped Amartya Sen's work. And that requires us to think a little bit more carefully about these environmental constitutive values that I've been alluding to. Now, the example that I have for this is one I've belabored a bit and one that I know several of you are familiar with. And this is the example of Chief Plenty Coup of the Crow Nation and Buffalo. So Chief Plenty Coup was uh, the last great chief of the Crow Nation. And he resided as chief over um, the time when the buffalo were um, vanishing from the prairies. And uh, it, was, it was obviously difficult. The buffalo served a foundational role for the Crow Nation. Uh, it served as a fixed point, a means of uh, not just material but cultural resource. And we can't express strongly enough just how central that role was. But the best way to do it is uh, to go to a quote that came out of an interview between Chief Plenty Coup and a guy named Frank Linderman, a, um, a trapper in the 1920s. And here's the quote. Chief Plenty Coup said, but when the buffalo way, went away, the hearts of my people fell to the ground and they could not lift them up again. That's, sorry. Uh, after this, nothing happened. So look at the bold face. After this, nothing happened. Of course stuff happened. He's being interviewed, right? And, and a lot of stuff happened to the Crow Nation. Not all of it very good, right? What in the world did he mean? What he meant was, from the point of view of the crow, they couldn't make sense of the world. The world was just a buzzing mass of confusion. It was weird, right? Now, of course, the crow people went on, right? You go on, you, you eat, you live your life, you go about have your, you know, your daily bread, right? But what it was to be crow didn't make sense anymore, right? They'd lost a constitutive feature of their notion of flourishing. What it was to flourish as crow became impossible. Now, this example has been taken on board uh, by Jonathan Lear in a book called Radical Hope. And his thought in Radical Hope was this, that we can take an example from Chief Plenty Coup 
Because what we're facing now in the Anthropocene with changing climates and destabilized environments and a world that's gone uh, weather weirding as the term is often used, right? The things are getting a little strange. Uh, we're losing our bearings. We need to find a way to be human in a world that's different from the one in which we have socially evolved. The example Chief Plenicu had was to this, to have a radical hope. Now, what's a radical hope? Well, to hope for something, you have to have an idea of the thing you're hoping for. Right? And to do that, you have to realize that you know, usually hope is tied with long odds. Like, you don't hope for something that's likely. That's kind of a waste of a hope. Right? It has to be something that's sort of a long shot. Right? And you have to have some sort of conception of what it might be. Well, the thought of a radical hope was this. He had a hope that the, his people would find a way to be Crow, even though he couldn't imagine what it would be. And because he couldn't imagine what it would be, there was no way to figure out what kind of long odds or make any sense of, sort of the probabilities involved. It was just the hope, the radical, empty hope, right? That there'd be some way. Now, I'm taking two general lessons from this, uh, from this example. The first is the essential role played by environmental background conditions on our, on our notion of flourishing. And that's, of course, you know, sort of the bread and butter of this talk, right? The basic idea that there are environmental features that play into our notion of flourishing constitutively. It's not that we choose an end because we're, it's not that we choose an end to be crow. It's not that the, the feature of the buffalo is simply a resource that allows us to live a life as crow. It's part of what it is to live your life, right? That constitutive role, that composite role is central. But more than that, look what Chief Plenicu was hoping for, that something would be generated by the broader environment in which the crow were finding themselves in this new world, such that they would be able to be crow. Now, this, this is something that, um, that I fumbled with for a very long time to try to make sense of, because it seemed to be incredibly important. Um, and it speaks to the way in which we think of flourishing not in the essentialist terms of Aristotle, but in the way in which we recognize that we can adapt to a changing world and adopt new ways of being that what Chief Plenicu was hoping for, that there would be new environmental features that will allow us to flourish. And I'll just transpose that just slightly, right? What he was recognizing was that in order to flourish some way as crow, there had to be some environmental feature in the world in order to enable them to flourish, to be part of what flourishing was. So this is philosophically sort of the twist, right? Um, we recognize that from Chief Plenicu's point of view, buffalo were central to what it was to flourish, but yet also that he had the great hope that there would be enough productive capacity in the environment to create something new that would constitutively involve what it was to flourish. There'd be a new way, not a buffalo, something new, something unknown. But the hope was really not just about his people, but that the people would find that thing in the world created an unknown and maybe not yet in existence that allowed them to be crow. And so Jonathan Lear's hope in my translation at least, is that we will find a way to flourish and be, and be human in a way that's, I don't want to use the word post-human, it sounds like a different kind of talk, but, um, but you know, that's beyond what we've been used to in this current day and age. So the point is, the possibilities that provided by the uncontrolled wild, uh, the uncontrolled environment, the wild as it were, provide a background that enables the possibility of flourishing and also at the same time shows us how important those environmental background conditions are that it's not just about seeing what's constitutive of our environment now, but our general reliance on there being something, we know not what, we know not when, that will play a central role in our flourishing, the wild. And we see this reflected in you know, two of the more famous quotes that show up in environmental context. There's the famous Thoreau quote about uh, in wildness is the preservation of the world, that the wild provides the resource that we need for this kind of material. Or uh, uh, my favorite misquote by Leopold, which I'm sure is an intentional misquote, Right? Uh, then wildness is the salvation of the world. This is from the end of uh, Thinking Like a Mountain. <clears throat> uh, that the idea that we might save ourselves or find a way by relying on the productive capacities of the environment, uh, as I misappropriate that quote. But in general, the thought is the possibilities derived from the productive capacities of our environmental background, that's an incredible resource. It's a resource that's made it's a resource that makes possible environmental goods. And so I'll come back to it in a minute, in the way we think about it as a resource. For it's more than just simply material. It's this living force that will play a central role. But the particular background conditions that serve a role, our environmental, uh, the environmental background conditions that play a role as environmental goods, uh, we can see when we think about the ways in which the environment provides a foundation for our identity, whether it's fishermen, whether it's fishermen or people just living on the shore, 
we can see it where we provide a foundation uh, for our conceptual frameworks, whether we think in terms of Buffalo or something else. And we can see it in the foundational points of our narratives. We are where we come from, we are who we are. Or rather, just because you have to put the quote in today, right? The country I come from, the country I come from is called the Midwest. You have to quote Bob Dylan, he just got the Nobel Prize. Um, uh, but it's the same kind of idea. We, we find ourselves, I find our identity tied up with the particular environmental features in which we find ourselves. So, the production of environmental goods, though, it's easy, uh, it's too easy when I say goods to think back as these fixed points, these operative points in our environment, as certain things, right? But I'm just going to emphasize again that it's not simply the medium sized dry goods approach to goods, right? That these goods are things that are transferred from mere resources to external goods, two ways of being. But there's a big difference between the, the, the mere resource that ecological systems enable. And the, breaking, and, the, uh, and the cultural practices that play a central role in who we are. There's a difference between the planting of grain and the breaking of bread, right? And that's sort of the, the transition to an actual cultural good that makes sense to us and allows us to understand ourselves and one another. But the production of good, environmental goods isn't simply a matter of, of agricultural goods. Those are just the most uh, poignant examples. For we, if we think about the ways in which the environment fits into our lives, we don't have to be going to the national parks to realize that recreation, culture, and aesthetics play a central part of human existence. We can see that in terms of shared practices that are only possible in a particular environmental context. And even individual, pra individual practices or experiences which are made possible by a new exposure to something grand and wild. And so this leads us to the point, the importance of the background generative systems, the environment that makes all of this possible. And here we have an extraordinarily brief foray into Holmes Ralston's own work. For the notion of systemic value is in the back of all of this. The productive capacity of background ecosystems is central to the creation of these environmental goods. But it's too easy there, just as it was too easy to shift into a conception of goods like medium-sized dry goods. It's too easy here to think of these mechanically. Rather, we should think of the possibilities that are enabled by these systems as part of those things that they enable. This is the whole point about the wild and Chief Plenicu. The thought that what he believed was important was that the world we were living in would enable there to be new environmental external goods, conditions that were part of our own conception of flourishing. Or as Ralston would say much more poetically than I, nature is a fountain of life. And the whole fountain, not just the life that comes from it, is of value. There's a special kind of value tied up in the wild and the productive capacities of those environmental systems. And that can't be removed from our own conception of flourishing. We flourish because of the environmental goods that are inseparable from the background systems that make them possible. So whether we think in terms of an owl or we think in terms of the wild in the background, these can play a constitutive role in the ways in which we understand ourselves, the ways in which we explain ourselves to others, and so the ways in which we flourish. That's what we need by sin. That's the environmental blind spot, right? If we recognize that flourishing isn't simply a matter of accepting certain kinds of resources or, or projecting certain kinds of needs or goods onto the world, whether what we need in the middle is a recognition that we are interdependent with the background environmental systems, with nature, that makes possible those features of flourishing that make us who we are, that provide us with our conceptual schemes through which we see the world, and provide us with the narrative, narrative footprints that allow us to talk to one another and make sense of one another. Or, real quickly, systemic value of ecological systems enables human flourishing through the production of environmental goods constitutive of flourishing. It provides the material goods, cultural goods, and shared practices. It provides a sense of place, a sense of who we are, an openness to the non-human world, an ecological citizenship, an awareness of our, inter an awareness of our interdependence with the non-human world. Now, these all turn out to be relational goods. And while they're not precise parallels with the external goods that were characterized in the social realm, they're pretty congruent. They're pretty close. I would feel funny if they were exactly the same. That would treat our social environment exactly as our natural environment. But it's easy enough, for, at least for me, to see that there is a certain kind of relationship that has to be held. If we think that something about being aware of the openness of our environment, of being aware of our relationship to it, and being tied to the, to the, to the being tied to a sense of place as part of who we are. If these are part of what it is to flourish, then surely the, envir the environment provides the same kind of external goods we see in the social realm. 
Just as the social environment enables flourishing through the, uh, through the generation of goods constitutive flourishing, so too does our natural environment. Whether we think of it in terms of the culture practice of breaking bread, the creative practice of planting, or the shared practice of harvesting, <coughs> the natural environment is part of who we are and how we live. <coughs> so that, I propose, gives us the beginnings of a background normative framework, a way of responding to the initial challenge and thereby the beginnings of an answer to the grand question that motivated this whole thing. So in response to Sen, we should just say something like this. Hey, create a normative framework based on the generative capacities of the natural systems on which we depend for those external goods, not simply on the needs we have. The needs will lead us to miss the constitutive role of all those environmental goods. It'll miss part of who we are. <coughs> or, as in uh, bumper sticker form, environmental goods generated, not material resources desired, will give us the right kind of answer fill our environmental blind spot and provide our missing shade of green. So if we really need to find a way to balance environmental protection and sustainable development, we should recognize that when we protect the world, we should do so just as we protect the social world. Now, it's part of who we are. And this brings me back to another historical figure real quickly, real quickly. Um, and this historical figure is John Stuart Mill. Now, at the end of utilitarianism, he argues for why justice is so important to people, given that we're all, he thinks, utilitarians, if you don't recognize it yet. Right? Um, and his thought just comes to this. We get so mad when people violate justice because societies are really extensions of ourselves. They provide the kind of, uh, they provide the capacity for liberty and happiness in a way that nothing else can. They are an extension of ourself. And so we viscerally respond to violations of society, violations of the justice that makes society possible as a kind of social self-defense. Social self-defense is just to recognize an extension of who we are. And so why should we protect the national world, natural world? For the same reasons we protect the social world. Natural self-defense. It's just an extension, just a little further. And, provide, and, why should we, and how do we provide for sustainable human development? We do so within the context of a, nurtur of a nurturing natural environment. We can't provide for human development without that context. That should be the focal point, not an afterthought. For our focus should be on environmental external goods. And if the focus is there, we should realize that simply the promotion and protection of environmental goods and the systems that provides them should be the focus both of environmental protection and development. Now that might sound like a platitude, but notice by now the notion of good here is fundamentally relational. What the goods here are, are the relations between humans and the natural environment in which they're situated. And these are the things that need to be promoted and protected. Not humans, not the environment, but the interdependence between the two. And if we realize the way in which that interdependence is tied up with our own notion of flourishing, I think that just makes a lot of sense. I'm not the first person to think this, right? For in 2000, uh, the, in, in 2000, it was mandated that we generate a millennium ecosystem assessment. Uh, about, uh, about 10 years ago, the final volume came out. It's, a, it's, it's monstrous, many, 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 many thousands of pages. Uh, and in it, we're listed and uh, characterized the many ways in which ecosystems and nature writ large provides a wide range of resources, not just material, but cultural and social. They seem like it's tied up with our identity. And then just a year ago, right, uh, just over a year ago, uh, in New York, we're ensconced after 15 plus years, uh, the sustainable development goals, where it was recognized that the needs of humanity isn't simply about money, uh, which we all knew, but was characterized in these 17 goals and 169 sub-goals, um, were characterized the many ways in which our needs are interdependent with one another and the environment. Now, to be fair, the, the 169 sub-goals led to a lot of flack for this. The, the magazine The Economist referred to the complexity of this system as, in, in beautiful eloquence, they called it stupid. Um, but really, the point here is one that matters a lot. Um, the sustainable development goals are, um, are designed to capture the wide ranges, the wide range of considerations that go into a life of human flourishing. We're not simple creatures. It's not just one thing. We don't need resources and have outputs that are values. What it is to flourish is complex and robust. It involves a wide range of social and environmental goods. And now it's supposed to be captured by these sustainable development goals. But here's the thing. As long as we have an environmental blind spot, as long as we think of the environment broadly, 
and reflexively. If we think of the word environmental goods, if we think of that expression, either as a resource or as an object of desire, we will see these two as fundamentally different things. We will see one as looking at the resources, of, of the resources provided in different contexts, the, uh, the agricultural, the material, the social, political, and cultural resources, and how they fit into our conception of the good life. And we'll see this in terms of the ways in which human needs are not being met or are being met. Right? And then we think about the environment afterwards. The relationality that allows us to see these two as the same kind of problem has vanished. And if you want evidence for how that's a problem, I take the Marches Sen, he's sort of my hero, even though I'm critical of him here. And a, a figure as progressive as a Marches Sen looks at these and sees two things. He endorses them both, but he sees them as two kinds of projects. And I see these as two projects that are not working in tandem, but on their way to convergence, right? And the point is, if we see this missing shade of green, if we fill our environmental blind spot, we should see this as convergence. So in conclusion, what we ought to do is focus our development efforts on the promotion and protection of environmental external goods, these relations between us and the world, right, that are inseparable, <laughs> inseparable, inseparable from the systems that generate them. For that is where we'll find our best grounds for environmental protection and the promotion of sustainable development. And I'll leave you with a fine picture of the Long's Peak. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken. Thank you very much. What questions do you have for Dr. Shockley? And I'll have to hand you the mic. A uh, very good talk. Thanks, thanks, Ken. I, I tend to agree with you that a focus on on flourishing can help give us the uh, the overall framework for for thinking about these questions. Um, but I wonder how you deal with with one particular problem. So in in 2014. Uh, the World Wildlife Fund scientists uh, working with them came out with a, a report that generated a lot of uh, a lot of attention. They they basically said in the previous 40 years, uh, humanity had basically done away with one half of the multicellular complex organisms on planet Earth in those in those 40 years. So, in pursuing our flourishing, um, we had had halved the number of other animals that, that uh, we were sharing planet Earth with. And I don't see any particular reason, based on our current heading, that we couldn't be just as successful over the next 40 years as we pursue our flourishing. So I'm wondering how you think about those kind of issues and the fact that, uh, you know, as we pursue our flourishing, we, we tend to displace um, other species. Uh, is that a matter of justice? Is there something in the, the framework of thinking about flourishing that can guide us in that? Uh, yes, uh, I do. I, I think that there, um, there is something in the framework that works. We pursue a lot of things badly. Right? Um, the pursuit of flourishing isn't the same thing as flourishing, of course. Right? And, um, and just as, let's see, think of a good social parallel. In the pursuit of a better life in America, we built way too many roads, and we uh, d destroyed our urbanization. Oh, sorry, we destroyed our urban centers. Uh, and in the process of doing that, we made ourselves more isolated from the world around us. And we thought that in doing that, we'd increase our gross domestic product and our economic growth would be great, and there was growth everywhere, and that's flourishing. No, it's not. Right? That's, that's an utterly failed notion of flourishing. What it is is just taking one particular part of what it is for humans to have a good life and in, in, uh, growing that and expanding that and thinking that's the whole thing. It's a confusion. And so I think we, could, we should probably take the same kind of lesson that, you know, God, I hope we've taken with respect to our social world. If we haven't taken it, we've acknowledged it, and apply it to the natural world. Our world is impoverished by the loss of those different species, and to this Sen was right. Right? The different values and operations available to us, the choices we have, are impoverished by the loss of biodiversity. We have fewer opportunities, and if sense even minimally right, right we're, we flourish less for it. Right? Um, and we can also think that, not just with Sen, but if we think that the environmental diversity is part of what it is to be human, that diversity is not just the spice of life, but part, in fact, of life, if it turns out that's the case, then that loss not only provides us fewer options and opportunities, but makes us less human. And I think that's sort of a, a vital feature. We are where we are situated. We are part of this place. We've made the place less good, and so are we. 
right? Um, I think that's the beginning. I mean, how you put that into practice is just a recognition that in the same way as our as social justice has pointed us to the failures we've had, uh, we've had with respect to uh, economic diversity and social inequity and stratification and all those matters, right? We can try to apply, apply the same kinds of lessons in the natural world, right? Um, now, are we going to be successful? Well, I hope we're at least as successful as the social world. It's kind of a low bar to hit, but we can at least try. More questions? In the back, I need to get the mic back to you. Yeah. Th thank you for your talk. Uh, with, with the uh, current uh, talk about uh, uh, manned exploration of Mars and a possible human settlement sometime in the future there, okay, uh, would you say it's possible for human flourishing to take place there, given the uh, alien natural uh, environment? Uh, or is it the case that uh, human flourishing is really uh, restricted to uh, life on, our, on Earth here? and the, uh, the air we can breathe without interposing any kind of uh, sophisticated technological apparatus between us and, and the outside environment, which is what we would have if, if, uh, uh, if, we, inv if we went to Mars. Without adding technological well, uh, people who are going to live on Mars, okay, are not going to be able to just walk out their door and take a deep breath. <laughs> They're going to need some uh, some kind of artificial apparatus um, that will uh, basically uh, uh, be there between them and and that in that natural environment. Uh, is human flourishing possible under those circumstances, or is it really confined to uh, uh, right here? So. So uh, can we flourish? It's a logical possibility that we could flourish in a case like Mars, which is kind of a cheat. Um, uh, but uh, but here's, the, here's the broader answer. I think that we already live like that. We already live in a veneer of society and technological framings. We already live with a wide range of materials between us and the natural world. Right? If we didn't, we'd be eaten. We are kind of weak as, as a species go, but we've done a pretty good job of building a very strong veneer in societies that allow us to be incredibly powerful. Uh, that building of the boundaries and borders, the building of the institutions, the building of the social broadly, is really, for me at least, as I understand it, not that different than the social technical. And so that's, um, I think that in the very least it's possible for us to flourish there. Now, uh, that being said, how we'd actually do it in a way that allowed us to see ourselves as having an identity as Martians, which is what we're really talking about here, right, um, is a little trickier. Uh, could we have that development? Well, I don't know. Um, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson has sort of a science fiction novel that puts us all the way, I guess it's going to be a movie too, that eventually gets you, know, gets you there with enough terraforming, uh, but effectively you're turning Mars into something other than Mars such that you could have it as part of your identity. You're finding a way to converge, change of you with the change of Mars until eventually you're there. Um, this, is a scientific, this is a science fiction ramble, but the thought is I can tell a story, I can make up a story that allows us to see a way in which we might uh, be able to flourish in the way I'm talking about in Mars, right? Do I think it's probable or possible? Not really, right? I, I, I don't think, I think that in too many cases, the idea of flourishing in, in this context is sort of like the idea of flourishing in the Robinson Crusoe setting. You only do so with a lot of extraordinary amount of background conditions and maybe some fabricated settings to make it possible. So, not really. It's weak. Yes? So I'm, I guess I'm wondering about the, the structure of the normative theory that you're beginning to sketch here, because it looks like what you're doing is ultimately you're still aiming at human flourishing, right? Um, you've just enriched it to include uh, aspects of the social and natural environment as constitutive features, um, but that means that other beings that can flourish uh, are not what you're centrally aiming at and are at best external goods, which is pretty good, 
right? But you could imagine a, a, a normative theory that says, no, what we should do is sort of maximize or optimize the flourishing of all flourishers and not just the humans. Um, so I'm wondering if, if you see that as fundamentally different from the view you have or as compatible with it. So what are the role of other complex animals, for example, if they have a, a, a welfare in that rich sense on your view? I've not tried to include a, um, I, this is a caveat, I've not tried to provide a general account of value or a complete axiology, right? That aside, uh, it's interesting to think about how the interdependence of, say, other humans flourishing. For on this account, as soon as we get away from Aristotle, flourishing is a very individualistic way, a, a very individualistic thing. And so there's no guarantees, and Sen has to deal with this, it's kind of a challenge for him, uh, that my flourishing and your flourishing are, gonna co are going to coincide. There might be conflicts. So I see no in principle reason why we couldn't include the flourishing of higher organisms and the external, environmental external goods that are available to them into this broad account. It just makes the social environment much more complicated, uh, predictably, right? Um, whether the notion of flourishing can be extended beyond higher organisms is, a, to me, a, an interesting question as well. Uh, and in that case, I'm not sure. I really don't. I mean, that would probably require us to think harder about the axiology, right? Um, this, this requires a certain conception of value, but doesn't require the, that it exhaust value. So there could very well be other things out there that must be considered and the, ex the, uh, the ways in which external goods of an environmental sort fit into them hasn't been discussed. And, and frankly, I don't know, but it'll be an interesting thing to figure out, right? I don't have a good answer. Maybe two more. Andre. Uh, throughout your talk, you, every once in a while, you said environment, then you said natural environments. And so in certain environments, you can certainly flourish depending on the type of environment. Let's say politics. Um, you're running for election, or even wealth, Wall Street, uh, the conventional good there, or flourishing would be money. And so why would that be, uh, would that be unnatural? Because that would seem to be a natural sort of product of the environment in which flourishing is defined in a particular way, and that would seem to be legitimate, at least given your argument. I think. It would be, it would be part of flourishing. It certainly wouldn't be exhaustive of flourishing. One of the great lessons of the Sustainable Development Goals, no matter what you think about them, is that they try to capture the wide diversity of considerations that fit into flourishing. There might be monetary values, but certainly even in a context like that, there's going to be social interaction values as well. But the broader question comes back to that, you know, that, that ever old problem from Mill and before, right? What is nature? What is natural, you say, right? And, uh, and what I'm trying to get to here is that there doesn't have to be a firm distinction. We're thinking about the social environment and the natural environment on a par, if I'm right. And in doing that, that just means we're focusing on what it is to flourish. We are social creatures. We are also natural creatures. So our form of flourishing that we engage in will have to capture all of those elements. The general approach and the general response, I would say, is that I think that particular conception of flourishing is too narrow. And it captures just one particular feature, one constituent of the good, not the whole good of which there are many constituent parts. Well, okay, let's do one more, and then we've got refreshments. So you had mentioned that you had a joke around the Rousseau painting that you wanted to bring up during the Q&A. So my question to you is, what is that joke? <laughs> A joke about a joke is even less funny. Uh, uh, so uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, right, uh, makes the, uh, uh, tries to answer the weird adage, how could you, when your currency is freedom, how could you ever gain freedom by binding yourself to a society, right? By creating new freedoms. So society makes possible certain kinds of freedom that wouldn't otherwise be available, right? And 
it's not a joke, really. I guess it's a philosophical point, right? <laughs> that it works. <laughs> it's, not even, it's not at all funny. But the idea is that uh, historically, we, we've, we've thought about this idea of generating new kinds of freedom and that they're generated because of the existence of a social background condition. And that is the point of Jean-Jacques Rousseau's social contract. And so the basic idea here is just an extension of that. Just as we see the social contract as a way of making new kinds of freedoms, a new way of being human, or as Rousseau would say, actually being human, right? So I would say the same kind of thing applies in this context, right? That we see ourselves as part of an environment and that makes us human. We just need to acknowledge it and not and stop pretending that freedom is about, you know, individual choices or clicking boxes on a test. So thank you for making me fail my joke. <laughs> well, I was born in Virginia and out of my cradle, I could see uh, mountains, uh, river. Virginia was constitutive of my youth, but I've been in Colorado 40 years, and Colorado has become constitutive of my being. I want you to ask Ken during the refreshments how long it's going to take somebody raised in uh, Michigan, uh, long in Buffalo, New York, to find that Colorado is constitutive of his being. Are we concluded? And as Holmes mentioned, we do have refreshments just down the hall in 243, the main philosophy office. There's a lot of food, so please eat it up, okay? And we'll open the door in just a moment. Thank you all. Thanks for coming.